Hi folks, welcome to Wednesday's I Write Radio podcast videocast. Um, we're going to have a chat about the presser, inevitably, as Aberdeen has been put into quarantine and hacked away from the rest of Scotland and sent out into the middle of the North Sea because it's a if unionist only. stronghold and it needs to be slapped about a bit. Uh, <laughs> Also brought up in the presser was the results um, again. So we'll have a wee chat about that. And then we're going to chat about the unionist unicorn of federalism. Um, but let's, let's kick off with the Aberdeen debacle. Stuart, we'll let you go first on this one. What do you think? Well, it was quite, it was not shocking, but surprising. Uh, to hear that there was such a, an out, a large outbreak. <coughs> I must admit that the, the numbers going from sort of 20 to 30 a day new cases to 54. And then the first minister saying that uh, they traced, to, traced nearly 200 possible contacts and they'd identified more than 20 bars in Aberdeen that might be involved in this outbreak. Now that's going to be a, an awful lot harder to, te uh, to trace than an outbreak in a call centre in Lanarkshire. Aye, aye, it is. Jimmy? Yeah, aye. Um, it's, clearly a <clears throat> it's clearly a worry. Um, I'm kind of impressed that we can get those numbers. Um, I think it's a, a pat on the back. It's going to be a big test for the track and trace team up in Aberdeen. But I think it's a pat on the back that we can have that information. Um, compare that to Blackburn in England, who yesterday had to start up and um, basically use their own track and trace team because the information and the numbers that they're getting from Serco aren't effective enough for them to track and trace correctly. And um, I do hope things don't get worse, but I think the First Minister was quite clear that they expect the numbers to go up. And um, basically, the restrictions that they're putting in place in Aberdeen, she's almost begging people to stick by those restrictions. You know, do not mix within, don't travel out with five miles, didn't mix in people's households bars and restaurants and that, shutting at tea time the night now. They're still in a sort of fig leaf to the bars and restaurant trade. They're still going to be able to do takeaway. So mm -hmm. they can still they can still make some money. But, um, well, yeah. me, on the question of um, finding out who, where, you know, where the original infection came from, that seemed to be part of the original question. What's this INT? What does that mean? Is, is this what the it's, 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 it's an incident management team, mate. It's an oh, incident right. management team that goes okay. in there and they lead. Um, they're all public health workers and they lead the track and trace um, effort. Oh, right. Uh, but I thought they were actually possibly referring to the, you know, the original question, how quickly can they identify where it came from? I think this was more about the genome. Uh, you, know, you know, they go into the genomes of the... Yeah, they can do genomic testing very quickly, mate. That takes... That takes uh, that, a week. That, that, that you've satisfied me now. Okay, that's fine. I think. But um, I think. Sorry, I think. As I say, mate, I, I noticed on Newsnight last night. There's, there's major, major issues with um, track and trace in England, and this isn't to bum up the SNP or the Scottish government. This is just to point out that because Scotland and the rest of the UK actually out with England went down a public health route, um, they seem to be doing it because they've done track and trace in the past you know what i mean and, and any other um yeah flu outbreaks for example they've done it in the past so they know exactly what they're doing you've not got staff who are basically getting trained on the job and how to get to, to the bottom of these things so they've got i think it's a good thing that we've got this amount of figures i think it's a great thing that we've got 200 or almost 200 contacts traced um and i also think that there's been more adherence in scotland you know, I know this is just anecdotal, but there has been more adherence for people wearing face masks. There's been more adherence for people um, 
keeping to the two metre distances. And I know that they didn't do that. I know that Soul Bar in Aberdeen, they had that horrid photo of the massive queue of them all crammed together. But we know ourselves, you know, when you go out, if you walk, when it was bouncing warm last weekend, I went down the park and there were hundreds, there maybe thousands of people in the park, but they were sitting in their socially distanced groups. There was clear evidence that adherence in Scotland has been much better. So hopefully we can get on top of this. As I say, it's going to be a big job for the team up there, but I hope they're up to it. I, I, I was impressed. I think, the, sorry, Nori. I think I'd like to make three points on this. The first point is the first thing I saw, or sorry, the last thing I saw last night on the telly was businesses in Aberdeen voluntarily yeah. shutting their doors, yeah. um, which I thought was great. And I mean, a couple of the bars involved in this were part of that. Um, and, I, and I couldn't help but think to myself, these guys have averted that, you know, let's not go to the Hawthorne bar because it's full of COVID by shutting their doors and saying, look, it's more important to our staff, our community, our city, that we just shut down for 14 days. Yeah, but maybe they already knew what was weird we discovered today. Maybe they did. I don't know, Stuart. But they went public and they said they were doing it. And if it was a PR exercise, it doesn't all look the fact they were prepared to shut the doors Aye. for 14 no, days. No, 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 yeah, no they, they did well. So, you know, that, that was the first thing about this whole thing that struck me as a good sign that businesses were prepared to take a hit for the greater good. Mm -hmm. um, not being mentioned today at all, but I, th I think it's worth mentioning. The, the second thing about this is the government's reaction, the Scottish government's reaction to it. Nip it in the bud, get it dealt with as quickly as possible. Be prepared to use a baseball bat on this. Be prepared to shut businesses down and say, look, you know, we're sorry this has happened, but we don't want this to spread. You're going to have to take a hit for the team. Wasn't it important that she, in the middle of explaining all these restrictions, new restrictions, she said straight away, you can refurlow furlow your staff? Yeah. Should, as I said yesterday, if you remember, all the, all the support is still in place, you know, it, it won't be in place come October, but it is at the moment. So now is the time. The third point I want to make is, in a lot of ways, this is a good thing. Because it, it lets people know two things. One, the virus has not gone away. Mm. It's still there, and it can multiply in the, in the community very quickly. And two, it lets the people know she's serious. We will shut you down. So it's a wake-up call. I hope I nobody ends up dying because of it. And I hope nobody gets really ill and has long-term effects because of it. But it's a timely reminder. And maybe in the long term, we'll look back at this and think, mm, okay, unfortunate, but was it such a bad thing? I think you're right. I think um, <clears throat> the fact that the numbers jumped quite so quickly, um, it might just be the wake-up call particularly to folk in their 20s and 30s that have the habit of going out in the nighttime economy and that do go for bar to bar, because that's what you do. You know yourself. Um, when you're pub a crawls. youngling. You, I've never I, been I, on a pub crawl in my life. Pub like. crawls. And, and, and also, mate, come on, if you walk into a barn that's a sausage fest, you have a pint and fire away to one that isn't it? Come right. on, I mean, that's just what you do when you're young. So, but... It, you're right, it could be a wake-up call. And I, like you, I hope they can get on top of it quickly and I hope that there's no major outbreak or what have you. Because um, you'd, need enough, you'd need enough of a big saw to cut the whole of Aberdeen off and send them oh, into the oh, middle of the 40s field or whatever. I was just wondering about this pub crawl thing and I'm trying to think about my life in the south of England and my life in Scotland. I wonder if it was any different. Probably not. I think it's just, you're right, I think it's just being young. You mm -hmm. go to one pub, uh, just to kick off, and then you move down to two, two, two or three pubs, even if it's uh, not that. I mean, you're right, the Jimmy Two's, I mean, if the pub's too full, you're not going to go in there. But you sometimes just set off to go down a street of pubs on a Friday right. night. 
I I, th I think one of the, one of the other things that I may have just forgotten, guys. <laughs> well, look, one, one thing uh, one thing that's not been done quite clearly has not been done is people's details. Oh, yeah, There's right. no way they're taking people's details if crowds like that are going from pub to pub to pub. Uh, Stuart, yeah. You know the the bowlers. The bowlers is a good solid working man's boozer. I don't know the bowlers. I've only been there once. Well, I know it, and Jimmy knows it, and they. I mean, this is a solid working man's pub who've got locals using it all the time, and they are taking everybody's details. Yeah, but that's not the kind of pub we're talking about. Well, they should be, and if they're not, how yeah, are, them? it's it's diff it's difficult. For, it's no difficult for pubs. Um, they, they do have three or four ways of doing it. Um, you know, the likes of um, Mike up the, up the town, he's um, taking everybody's details, he's covering people book tables. There's a few of them that are absolutely cashless at the moment. Um, but I think, I think this is the wake up call to pubs everywhere else around the country that they need to have these details. They absolutely 100% yeah. need to have these lists just in case something happens. And it's also probably a wake up call to everybody that's gone to a boozer and went, oh, well, if they're not taking their details, I'm no fussed. Because um, if, <laughs> if I walk into a pub next week and they're not taking details and I think the place is not um, up to code, I'll just walk back out. Aye, and I think the public have got a serious part to play in this if people aren't doing it properly. Yeah, um, I'd agree well, with you. Look, I, I think in, in, walk the, away. in the bigger picture of this, it looks as though that it, it, we could be talking about a, quite a long-term thing. And we all of us have got to get into the habit of new habits because we could be, we could be doing this right up to next Easter next year, easily. Well, I'll tell you mm. what I would have done if I'd been... Um, pubbing it these days, which I'm not, but had I been living my life as I used to 10 years ago, I'd have got a pile of business cards made and just Hi. simply put the time I was on the premises on the back of it and chucked it in a jar. That's not a bad idea, mate. I, uh, no. the, the, wee, the wee local printers will be loving you, Norrie, if well, folks start I mean, jumping in on that one. And where's the hassle? I mean, they no, do it anyway. You know, they do it in restaurants and things where they have the big mm -hmm. glass. And you go for lunch, you throw your business card in, and you maybe win a, a free oh, lunch. Oh, 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 oh. A come on, it was, su it was such a civilised oh, thing. Last century to have a, have a card holder and just drop your card into people. It was a, can, can well, we go back a hundred years? There's a modern version of that where you get that squiggly square thing. Yeah, aye. Keep, keep your modern versions, mate. The squiggly square thing just bugs the, the James out of me. I didn't want my phone reading things and policing me here, there, and everywhere at the same time. Just It's just a data that somebody's going to buy and send me weird it, adverts further down the line. Now, if I meet a stranger that I, I, I take a fancy to, and I'm not talking sexually, I just think, well, mm. it's somebody I would like to speak to again, business, social, nothing to do with it. But just that, oh, yeah, I've met somebody interesting. Uh, before I finally drift off to get another bar or another speak to another person, I might just hand them a card. You, that's a lot easier than going digital, isn't it? Mm. I like the digital card swipe thing, uh, you know, where you just take a photograph of somebody's business card and it's digitally entered on your phone. I think that's quite good. Um, let's move on, though. Let's get political. Right. Um, as I said earlier in the green room, um, okay. This Aberdeen shutdown has been not so much a dead cat as a dead lion. It oh, has... sorry, sorry, sorry. Just before you go there, I just wanted to mention one thing. That, that When you talked about dead lion, it just came straight back into my head. I think if we hadn't had those figures in Aberdeen today, we'd be talking about another 15 cases in Greater Glasgow and saying, is there a cluster oh, yeah. there as well? Yeah. 15 cases in Greater Glasgow is actually quite an important thing to look at too. Well, if, that, if that's the ones down in the, in Berkeley that's related to a, a pharmacy and possibly Amazon. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's Berkeley. ancient. Well, well, that was last week, but that, that could week. be, that's with the incubation period, it could be that, that they are related, not eh? Oh, right. I'm glad you mentioned the incubation period. We should be pointing out that 
we're now what two and a half weeks since the pubs opened fully and we mm -hmm. were in, anticipating a bit of a uptick in, in, in the virus so let's not Aye. be shocked or surprised and yeah. we have had, although let's also be aware that schools are due to open what is it a week today yeah well they start so, again next week don't they the, with the appraisals and things Orient so, orientation here's yeah. hoping that they have a, they're on top of the thing in Aberdeen that they don't have Why to then? cause schools going back next week anyway uh, no. dead yeah, lions deep. um as opposed to dead cats this has kind of shut down the well certainly at the press conference the debate about the exam results um mm. the press i don't know why they didn't use the six months 12 months they had since the last ones to think up new ideas to attack the scottish government with but the main attack seems to be the fact that this is class warfare by the education yeah. authorities um they seem to be saying that schools in less privileged areas are being hit harder. Although statistically, that seems to be what should be happening. Um, well, I think I, I took a look at it just last night. I watched specific pieces because I'd, I'd had a look at a couple of tweets and Kieran Jenkins was for Channel 4 was annoying me. You know what he's like. He loves to get his teeth into a story. But So I watched his piece last night and it seems clear to me that that was a piece that was planned weeks in advance. Um, he went out to the Rapplock in Stirling specifically to find kids from an impoverished area who'd been marked down and found a couple um, to fit into this, wedge them into his story. But basically, he and his collaborator... Jim McInerney had been kind of tweeting and working on this that the system the SQA was setting up was wrong and that they knew better. We also had um, Mary Black who tweeted pretty early on in the day and rather inopportunely in my opinion because the information, the full information had not yet come out before she was stomping her feet. And Ross Greer was another one for the Green Party who seems to, he went on and on about middle-aged men defending the SQA. Seems to, whilst growing his beard to look like he's an adult, he seems to still be <laughs> spitting his dummy out and desperately wishing that adults would shut up so that because he's clearly cleverer than all adults combined. But what none of them came to, came up with an, any decent argument actually, because their, their arguments are straw arguments as far as I'm concerned, but what none of them stopped to consider is that the SQA had to put this whole system in place in a couple of months. They only cancelled, you know what I mean? We locked down in March, we, we shut the schools. We decided that exams were only taking place, what, six, seven weeks before the exams were due to take place. Hmm. They couldn't possibly have built a system that would have done the individual assessments of every pupil in Scotland in that time. It was absolutely 100% impossible to do that because you couldn't employ the amount of experts and educators. You would need to do that. So the system that they put in was basically ramping up. Um, it's almost ramping up an appeal system in a way. Well, they're, 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 Jimmy, the appeal system is the important part of the, part of yeah. the system for the individual pupil. Sorry, what do they call them these days? Students, am I showing my age? Mm -hmm. And uh, it is very important. But as, what the other point is, it really wasn't stressed in any, well, bit by bit. I did watch some of the sort of like BBC television and STV and all the rest of it last night to see what the reaction was on them. They barely touched on the, the other the side of the coin. It's all very well getting upset about your child not getting a, a good uh, assessment <clears throat> and its life is now ruined, which is not. But mm. there is the credibility of the, the, the results. If you walk out looking for a job with a certificate from 2020 on a, from a system that looks ridiculous with no credibility for employers, what's your future with that? But no, nobody right. wants to go and find employers 
universities, colleges, people who do training courses and ask them whether they think this system is credible. Because I'm pretty sure they've been asked before this was put in place. I mean, if you were putting a system in place to create qualifications, wouldn't you want to ask the people who create the jobs that match those qualifications whether they were satisfied that it was robust? Yeah, exactly, Nori. You absolutely have to believe that everything about that system was run past UCAS, for example, because UCAS are going to be offering university places based on these results. Yep, so and not one article, not one journalist, I haven't seen it on the telly, has asked any employers about whether they believe this system is robust. So what is the conclusion we can come to? It's quite simple. As usual, the Scottish media has attacked the Scottish government because everything the Scottish government does is SNP bad. Yeah, yeah. I think it was... I think, was, it was, it was I think they're... The I, think they're, on you go, on you go. I think they're entitled to question it. I do think they they're are, entitled to question it. I think they're entitled to question it, but they're not entitled to attack it. They're not entitled to go and grab the usual suspects. But we're entitled to expect them to be even-handed. Mm -hmm. Because well, the people but, this really matters to are the children and the employers, universities, whatever. So all the children who are disappointed are getting interviewed. That isn't true. The BBC did do a fairly even-handed piece last night at six o'clock, BBC Scotland, yeah. um, where they spoke to kids who were happy with the results and they spoke to kids who weren't. But there's I another that, side to that. No but, no, but did they speak to any kids? Did they speak to any kids that might be worried about the credibility of the results? Kids don't even care what credibility is, mate. They're kids, but their parents should know a lot better. They think, will your result actually get you into the university you think it will in England because it's 2020 result? Well, England are running the same sort of system, so it'll be interesting ah, to right. see. That'll be, be, in, be interesting when in a couple of weeks when all their results come out if they, we see the same kind of attacks, although you probably won't because you've got individual exam boards down there. I think there's about four or five, isn't there? So... <laughs> More than that. You probably won't see a concerted attack. I think I think the First Minister drew a line under it. I mean, yesterday, both her and John Swinney pointed out the, the, <laughs> the far, more, far greater importance that they're setting on the appeals process this year. But I think she effectively draws a line under it today by pointing out or, or labelling the appeals process for what it is. It's individual moderation. So yeah. for the people that aren't happy that their mark has been moderated, appeal it and you, they will take a closer inspection of it. But don't you be surprised if you appeal it and you don't get a massive upgrade on it because the SQA and appeals processes don't give massive upgrades. You might, get, you might go from a D to a C, you might get a pass, but you're not going to go for a D to uh, an A. All right. But the, but the other side, the other side of the appeal. Your postwork was crap, your prelim was crap, and they're taking a look at their computer, and your teacher's got a history telling poor pies to yeah. try and make themselves look good. The other side of the appeals process is that it's important, obviously, for uh, people waiting for um, results, confirmed results, to go in to get offers from universities. It's a limited time period. But uh, apparently they've taken on extra staff to handle the appeals process. Wait a minute, wait a minute. The whole appeals process is timed. Yes. Yes, well, that's what I, just what I said. Yeah, but that, I mean, but sorry, all, sorry, I thought you said there was a problem with UCAS. The whole point is no, no, that I you never, get through the appeals process. No, 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 I never said that at all. What I'm, ah, right. what I'm pointing to is the fact that they've taken on more staff in anticipation of a lot more appeals. Ah, it was interesting that the Scotsman ran a front page story today saying that there'll be at least 100,000 appeals this year. It'd be interesting to know where the Scotsman came up with the mathematics for that figure, but I don't think the Scotsman need to actually justify that. It was just a wee bit of scaremongering, wasn't it? Well, Jumping I, on the I, would, I would imagine the people that are running the system have a pretty good idea of what to expect. Ah, well, mm. So they probably phoned them up. <laughs> Either that or they probably just made it up. Um, well, it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't be unlike the Scotsman to make things up, mate. Eh? Their website is possibly one of the worst 
websites you ever have to well, navigate yourself around and some of the writing that, that gets published in that, news, that newspaper these days is laughable. If, Can, even if you're very keen to, to read a story on, let's say, the evening news site, which is the same company and the same paper, mm -hmm. as soon as I click on it, it suddenly piles in ads and therefore I don't get to see my story, I just go somewhere else. It's ah, a, it's a, it's it, an ad, it's an ad platform, Stuart, more than anything else. But I, it just turned, I, I'm not, I don't waste my time on it. They don't get no clicks off of me. Can anybody right. tell me why there are different exam boards in England? Well, no like, idea. I don't know if it's regional, I don't know how it works, but if there are several exam boards in England, um, why is that? Why can't they just have one exam board? I've no idea, but one of them's called Oxford, so it probably sounds it's more important yeah. than others. I, I think it was purely the fact competition, mate. The Tories love competition and they've run in England for an awfully long time, haven't well, they? Well, I'll, I'll be honest with you, Jimmy. I think that system's been around a long longer than the Tories have been privatising. Well, can, can, we can, can we just stop a minute? Can we just stop a minute and think about that? About what? Well, I don't know how many boards there are. Say there are five boards. How do they maintain the same standard between those five boards when they're marking papers? Because the English government asserts that it is so, and we have just to believe that. Right, okay. I, I, yeah, I, but they still have a credibility. Um, don't forget, educational attainment, certainly at sort of what we call secondary level, is an international thing that matters to people, especially if they're bright children. Well, it matters if you agree with the criteria they use. That's what I mean. I mean <laughs> it doesn't matter, matter if you don't. I mean, okay, let's move okay. on. Um, Mr. McQuarter of the Herald used the F word today. Well, uh, has an article where he is spinning for federalism um, because he somehow thinks that an independent Scotland, Ireland, uh, sorry, Northern Ireland, Wales and England could come to a new Treaty of Union agreement where Scotland got everything it deserves and England would just acquiesce to that. <coughs> Jimmy, don't choke. <laughs> yeah, the, the whole premise of that just sticks in my crummy. I actually love the idea that a federation of the British Isles wouldn't be in hock to the USA anyway. Oh, I never thought about the USA on this basis. It's the first thing I thought about. The I, very I, first I, thing I thought. I had, I hadn't. I, nah. I, you know, you're right. I suppose from an American perspective, when you look at the British Isles, you just think about all these American bases scattered on this aircraft carrier that's a big rock. Well, I'm, I'm pretty sure that any trade deal with America is going to tie us into their arms trade, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I think that's disappearing fast anyway, a quick trade deal. Yeah, it looks like it. It looks like it. Unless they get what, something what about, done what before about Trump. Fox? What about Liam Fox getting hacked? Oh, dear. You've you got you to laugh. He is coming into another Chris Grayling, isn't he? You always has been. You read the piece, Stuart, and you kind of thought it might have been ghosted. Well, it's just because it seems so odd. It, it's like, because he maybe he's just had a drink too many before he wrote it, or he's, he, it, it's like, they didn't sound like Eamon Porter. He usually is much more sympathetic to the, uh, the Scottish independence angle. I'll tell you what I'm going to, I've got one, one two-liner here. He says, after all, this Westminster really needs Scotland. It needs a common travel area, a viable internal market, a common currency, defence and national security. Oh, aye. So who's going to be in charge of the currency? Defence, national security, a common currency means an English currency. Well, exactly. So it's, because it's, why, if you were even more independent of each other than now, would England ever make a financial decision to the benefit of Scotland and right, the detriment but, yeah. of England? But the point is, he doesn't answer. I mean, this is just a list of questions, as far as I'm concerned. What, what, I mean, who is actually in charge of defence and security? The biggest part of it. Well, so what's different? Or in, in the case, in five years' time, the USA. 
he's right. just he's just making a it's a sop to the Labour Party because London Labour are talking about some kind of federalist nonsense. I mean, they're using the F word, but they're not defining it in any way. They well, can't we... define it because the minute they define it, it gets shot down. So it's just he's basically holding a hand out to the Labour Party and saying, you know what? I still love you, really. Even though I'm writing stuff that's kind of disparaging to you, I still love you, really, and I'm still your man. I'm still well, your creature. But it, it seems reasonable that somebody should discuss the possibility that apparently the, the Lords even have come up or possibly got a, 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 a new Act of Union plan under their belt. The mainstay of which will be Scotland cannot have another independence referendum. Exactly. I mean, right. somebody did have to write about it, but honestly, I don't really make any sense of it at all. I'm sorry. Ian, well, you, it, the, any, word, any, the words any, in perpetuity, the words in, in perpetuity will be all over any bill coming out of the Lords. Why have neither right. of you mentioned... Which makes it a non-starter. Exactly. Well, yeah, I'll tell you what makes it a non-starter. The name of the unionist columnist that mentioned it. Stephen Daisley. I mean, as if oh, he's that a happened. horse, he's ass. Exactly. That's a polite way to put it. I was going to. Jimmy, be Jimmy, we're getting the stables are getting really, really too big now. There's so many horses' asses going about. Aye, uh, well, that's not my fault, mate. That's a fact that we've lived in this union for three hundred years, and people are trained to be horses' asses from a very, very early age. Particularly, they, they all particularly these expensive schools in Scotland where they uh, educate all trace of Scottishness out of you. But they also walk right around too. like this all the time, tugging their forelocks. Uh, yeah. I'm glad my forelock's gone. Aye, uh, me and all. You can't um, be accused of, a, of, a, of being a cringe master. What, what and let's I be find... honest, I could, I could never be a unionist with a nose like this, mate. Never find a crevice big enough. <laughs> I'll take your word for it. Mm. What I find interesting about my quarter's list is uh, nukes stay on the Clyde. Body. Any major fiscal decisions are still made at Westminster. And as I say, why would you ignore what England needs to the benefit of Scotland? It's just a nonsense, mate. We know that. Um, as, as, as I say, it's why Keir Starmer Stern, will happily use the word, but he'll never define what federalism is. Because okay, the minute he does... The SNP can take it apart piece by piece and show it for what it is. But Jimmy, we can have a never-ending convention. Uh, you can stick your convention where this, the horses no longer are stable. Okay. <laughs> now, but there's one other big point from the, what that quote I've just read out. Uh, I've forgotten what it is now. Oh, <laughs> shit. <laughs> this does happen, you know, when you go. Uh, mm -hmm. Policy. Oh, God, there's a one huge... One huge Foreign point. policy. No, no, it's much more. No, it doesn't matter. It'll come back to me after we go over. We, in fact, I mean, in Ian's federalism, we have no power except over taxation. And we won't have any power ah, no. over that because we'll have the same currency, okay. so we'll Sorry. have to align. What he doesn't ask is what he tells you. What does Westminster really need from Scotland? Well, it, it doesn't even mention the money that they, they need from Scotland. Oil, there you wind go. energy. That's what I was trying to get to. I'd forgotten about the oil. Sorry. Guys. He also doesn't mention what does Scotland need for Westminster. Ah, well, there you go. It doesn't Arman. ask that question. Arman, what, please, sir. Uh, please, sir. Freedom. We need we freedom. need more people in the Lords, sir. Can please, we, sir. Uh, aye, aye. That would be a good idea. A bigger, a bigger green bench for Ruthie to sit on, because she'll need you in a tank size one to fit that keister on it. And we need to be able to give our money to London for their tolly tunnels. Mm. We need that money to invest somewhere, or to pay their, pay their soldiers for their foreign wars. But Stuart, go and read out that list again. Have you got it to hand? It's very short. It says to me, all that uh, Westminster really needs from Scotland, common travel area, Mm -hmm. We've got that anyway, and they've got that with Southern Ireland. I Southern Ireland. And, got that. Yeah. Viable internal market, Southern Ireland have got that. A common currency. Now, I don't, I'm, 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 a, I'm a new convert. To well, a current, common currency means that Westminster control yeah. your currency. Yeah. Your, and your, your, your whole economy. Yeah. Your fiscal decisions. Yeah. Defence, as you say, the Trident left and the Clyde. And what is mutual security? And that's the, that's the entire list. A mutual security is being an ally. Hmm. 
basically yeah, but... you agree foreign, po foreign policy. So if the United States wants to go to war with Saudi Arabia and England wants to go to war with Saudi Arabia because America tells them to, we have to go to war with South America, uh, sorry, Saudi America. <laughs> <laughs> Now there's a slip of the Saudi tongue. Arabia, uh, uh, because England's support in the USA. So this is my uh, big question. Ever since 9/11, given that it was nearly all Saudis, Saudi uh, Arabian people, that flew these planes into uh, the, the Twin Towers and the Pentagon and wherever, and what they tried to go for the White House as well. But it's I on. Didn't America bomb Saudi Arabia. Because it had, it had nothing to do with the people that buy American weapons. Jimmy? I was just going to say the Americans didn't bomb their allies. Ooh. Some allies. That is subtle dig. Subtle dig. Some allies, eh? Um, well, they are. The, the, the elite of Saudi Arabia, the royal family, and oh, all their wee princelings. Oh. I know, I know, I know. Excuse me. I think if you were to go back and you discover these people that flew these planes, all 14 or 15 of them were Saudis, were pretty well high up in the Saudi. None of them, none of them were royal family. Okay. What about Osama? One of the he wasn't Saudis. royal family either. One of the richest families in Saudi Arabia. He wasn't royal family. His dad was a builder. <laughs> Okay, I'll give in. Seriously, that says dad's money came out yeah, of building built, he built, shit. He built airports and ports and things. He didn't yeah. he build your garden shed. So only builders, you only get to call somebody a builder if they only build garden sheds. Okay. He's a builder. Change the subject. I don't know. Uh, right. The final thing I'd like to touch on is your pal, Stuart. Mr. Oh, Mr. Hothersall. A nice laddie, by the way. Nice laddie. Or as some like to call him, bother us all. Um, Duncan wrote an editorial in Labour Haim, basically suggesting that the Labour Party should throw out half its membership. Um, Scottish Labour Party or the Labour Party? Scot in Scottish branch office. Bless. So he wanted rid of Corbyn Easter's, anybody that supported independence, and I think maybe socialists. No, he didn't uh, say he did, socialists. He, 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 he certainly wants rid of getting close to half of the members, which is <clears throat> a real surefire winner to um, building a campaigning party that can come back and return to its former glories of, well, it might actually manage second place, depending on how badly the Tories do in an election. Not with Richard Leonard, they're not. Well, Dun Duncan was right. I mean, right at the beginning of the Corbyn thing, he did say it's not going to last forever. I don't think he thought it would end quite the way it ended by the Labour Party stabbing Sorry. each other all over the place. Sorry, I don't need Duncan Hothersall's brilliant mind to say that when the Corbyn thing started, I didn't think it would last long either. Well, I, well, Stuart, that wasn't a criticism of your opinion on it. I was just saying, for a Labour man, Duncan has held his position through thick and thin. Oh, he's a, so, he's, uh, he's a Tory. He's, he's a new Labour. He's pink. He's Blairite. He's a Tory. I think he's a Blairite. Right? I wouldn't call him a Tory. A red, well, he's a red Tory, mate. Tony Blair's never been a socialist in his life. Uh, red Tory. Well, but I think sure I think I think Peter player, right? I think P Peter Bell kind of replied to Duncan's um, piece, and he was pretty derisory. Although I mean, he he does call Duncan Scotland's biggest cringe monkey, which I kind of like. But um, he, he he was he was almost gentle on him in one way, in that he kind of accepts that Duncan Hothersill is just a, a lone wolf ploughing his own idiot furrow and you didn't want to, I mean he might have some issues so you didn't want to beat him up too much I think the, the thing that struck me most about that was Peter saying I, it's lovely when you just have that strange um, habit, that, sorry that strange it's not a habit is it that strange thing that he's got where he now 
pronounces himself editor of his own blog site. And if you've got to build your own self-importance up that oh, much, no, no. it's probably no worth listening to. That's not accurate. Oh, Labour Haim isn't he a blog? Well, La- Labour Haim existed before, had other editors before Duncan. Uh, and it is official. I think that, and the title came from Conservative Home. <laughs> mm. <laughs> oh, I wouldn't bet money on that. Labour Haim might have been around longer than that. Um, I don't actually, it used to be a go-to place for me. I used to read it quite often, but I haven't, mm. haven't been there for a while. You know, Do you think it, that's because there's not been anything relevant on it for some considerable time? Uh, yes. Well, there's nothing been, there's been nothing relevant about the Labour Party for so long. Every time they pop up into the news, it's about a fight amongst themselves, not about them actually doing anything or challenging the government. I'll tell you the most impressive thing I've seen about Labour in the last six months is Jack McConnell's hair since lockdown. Have you seen it? It's brilliant. <laughs> he looks like a... Bl- I, I didn't care if he got it done deliberately or if it's just grown that way, but he looks like something. A Rome man. It, it's, oh, it's, here, here, I heard this week, maybe it was a Twitter truth, maybe it wasn't, that Jim Murphy, the, the most successful short-term Labour leader in Scotland, has Aye. excised his time as Labour leader in Scotland from his curriculum vitae. Aye, I've seen that. He's, he's running a, some political operators group down in London and there's no mention of it. He's, he's, mate, this, this is the beauty of it. They describe themselves as being able to fil- facilitate successful political campaigns. Hence the, reason, <laughs> hence the reason that he's, he's absolutely wiped that short period of time where he was going to lead Labour to all kinds of victorious stuff in Scotland and uh, took them from 41 MPs to one. <laughs> oh, well. I mean, we have to wish Jim good luck. Well, we don't. <laughs> If not, if nothing else, me, if nothing else, me, I never ever knew Pterodactyl could talk till I seen him on the telly. Is is membership of the Henry Jackson Society on his CV? Do you know? Almost. It, it, it absolutely is, me. Aye, because he's still involved with that. Right. Oh, okay. Anybody? Do yourself, do yourself a favour and have a look at Jack McConnell's hair. It is absolutely brilliant. It should be an I Claudius or something here like that. But that puts Jim Jim Murphy in the same club as Liam Fox. Aye. Abject, Aye. At, abject at their choice of chosen career. So now, fair play to him, mate. He's, he was a rank rotten politician. So now, what is his day? He talks to people about politicians. How to be a rank rotten politician. And I just wanted to point out at the end, before you go for something funny, I want to put, put out there, I don't know if you've seen the advert after the press conference had finished, Norrie, but everybody who values their sanity do not go on Twitter next Wednesday at about 10 o'clock at night because Neil Oliver's got a new series about the clans of Scotland starting on BBC One Scotland. And the minute that that programme's finished, the invective that will be released towards Neil Oliver will be the poison. Not, you anyway, read it. Is that, is that not a repeat of a... The clans of Scotland, he's already made it about four years ago, I think. No, do mate, it's no, it's no repeat. It's a new series. The BBC have chucked mere money at do we not have anybody in Scotland who's actually a historian as opposed to an archaeologist who can present Aye, these do, kind mate, of programmes? They're, they're not touching up the BBC Director General under the table. Mm-hmm. Uh, allegedly. Do we have anything a bit more lighthearted to finish with, apart from the vision of Neil Oliver hair flowing, touching up the CEO no, of the uh, Scotland BBC? Aye. Aye. Nothing. Um, funny. No, it was. It really wasn't much of a funny day yesterday, mate. I'd like no, to. Wasn't if, a lot. if there's any Lebanese people out there that watch us, I'd like to pass on my Aye. sympathies for what happened yesterday in Beirut. I can't even believe when I seen that. I, I thought that was an attack when I first seen the shockwave oh, no, coming no, off no, that, that explosion. That was, it was massive. That was a TV horror moment. It was a bit like the 9-11 thing. Cause, um, it really was. I, 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 I thought, Jesus, what on earth puts out a shockwave like that? I thought the Israelis had hit Beirut well, or something. Well, but, I don't think we're absolutely certain yet on whether it was deliberate or an accident. Well, uh, they're saying now that it was 2,500 tonnes of um, ammonia nitrate in a warehouse at the docks, mate, and that would for make a heck of a bag. I mean, that's, that's de- devastated the whole city centre. I mean... Mm-hmm. I have to admit, when I first saw it on Twitter, my first thought was, 
what kind of bomb was that? Because Aye. it looked so different from everything else I'd ever seen. Aye, the shockwave. Um, to, to be able to see the shockwave oh, yeah. like that was quite a shocker. It, it was a massive, massive explosion. Well, it, it was the plume of smoke. Um, I oh, that was, was once a fireman. Um, mm. And I thought, you know, that doesn't look like the, your usual car bomb oil smoke. Um, right. So I'd, I'd, I was kind of primed to be told it wasn't. It was, it was horrendous to see some of the footage, mate. It reminded me of being a kid at school. It reminded me of how Beirut looked like in the 70s and 80s when there was constant civil war aye, going on. About it. Well, I think we'll call it a day at that, lads, on that unhappy note. Mm-hmm. And we obviously pass our best wishes on to anybody with family out there or whatever. Yes. Um, thanks, Stuart Lockhead. Okay, cheerio. Cheers, Jimmy Hunton. Cheers. And I'm Norrie Stewart. We'll catch you tomorrow, which is Thursday. Um, is she in Parliament tomorrow, Nicola? Don't think so, mate. I think they might go back next week. No, I think it's just cool. twelve fifteen tomorrow. Twelve fifteen. Presser as usual. Thanks for listening, folks, and we'll catch up with you tomorrow. Cheers for now.